Hey folks, my name is Dexter Lawrence Jr. aka Young Shepherd, and you know that on my channel it's all about life and godliness. The, the question that we're going to be asking and answering today is what does the Bible say about speaking in tongues? Man, in the Christian community there is so much controversy, confusion and calamity concerning this issue of speaking with tongues. On one extreme of the argument, you have some Christians who are saying that speaking with tongues is not a valid practice in the church today. And if there's any tongue speaking going on, it must either be mere gibberish or simply demonic. On the other side of the spectrum, some Christians believe or some people believe that if you don't speak with tongues that you're not spiritual and you may not even be saved in the first place. You may not even be a Christian. And, and somewhere in the middle of those two extremes, you have uh, uh, some Christian groups that are more open to speaking in tongues as a valid practice today, and some Christian groups who are more closed off and are really avoiding the topic all together. What we're going to be asking and answering is not what, what each Christian group is saying. What we're going to be asking and answering is what does the Bible say about speaking in tongues? Before I begin, I just want to establish two things. The first thing I'd like to establish is, listen, I am not a cessationist. Well, some of you may be wondering, what, 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 what is a cessationist, right? Listen, cessationists are those who believe that after the Bible was completed, that the Holy Spirit ceased giving or stopped giving certain supernatural, miraculous gifts to individuals in the body of Christ. Cessationists tend not to believe in speaking in tongues and, and the gift of prophecy, gifts of healing and gifts of miracles and so on today because they believe that those things were relegated to the time of the first century apostles and the time before the biblical canon was completed. So they're saying, listen, those things were the time period of the apostles, of the disciples, in the scriptures, in the Bible, and it, that was for a time before the Bible was finished being written. That's what they believe. I am not of that same opinion or persuasion because I do not see sufficient biblical evidence to substantiate that claim. I see nowhere in the Bible that suggests or even seems to suggest that after the completion of the Bible that certain gifts will cease. Instead, I am a continuationist. I believe that gifts such as tongues and prophecy and healings, that these gifts continue to be given to the church today. Maybe in another video we will discuss the, the different arguments between continuationism and cessationism, and I can tell you why I land in the continuationist camp. The second thing that I'd like to say to us today is that our background and our experiences as it relates to this particular subject matter really does affect how we feel about it. How you feel about speaking in tongues, whether you believe it's for today or not for today, whether you're kind of uh, uncomfortable with it or whether you're very, very engaged and open with it, that a lot of that, maybe not all of that, but a lot of that is dependent on your background and your experiences. You see, if you grew up in a church context where they taught you that tongues and prophecy and those types of things are not for today, even if someone presents to you biblical evidence to the contrary, they're showing you in scripture that these things, here's what the Bible says about prophecy, here's what the Bible says about tongues, it will still be very difficult for you to accept that what they're saying is true, believe it or not. And on the other side of the argument, if you grew up in an environment that emphasized speaking in tongues so much that they even tried to pressure you and you felt like you had to speak in tongues just to show people that you're serious about the things of God and to show people that you're really a Christian, that also may have left a bad taste in your mouth on the subject matter. So, so here's what I want to ask each and every one of us as we listen today. I want us to come with an open mind. 
Let us have this determination to say whatever scripture says about this matter, that is what I will stand on. If the scripture says something that agrees with what my church has taught me, then I'll stand on scripture. But if scripture says something that disagrees with what my church has taught me, I will still stand on scripture. And so let's run to scripture to see what biblical points we can capture from the word of God about the matter of speaking in tongues. I want to also say that our treatment of speaking in tongues today is in no way or form an exhaustive uh, treatment of this particular topic. There, there has, has been much written, there has been much uh, published about speaking in tongues, and so we're just going to be touching on a few nuggets in our video today. Point number one, the Bible says that speaking in tongues is a gift or an ability given by the Holy Spirit. Allow me to read from you for, from 1 Corinthians 12 verses 7 to verse 11. Here we see the Apostle Paul discussing the way that the Holy Spirit gives different gifts to different persons in the body of Christ for the benefit of everyone. It says, To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. For to one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom, and to another the utterance of knowledge according to the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healing by the one Spirit. To another, the working of miracles. To another, prophecy. To another, the ability to distinguish between spirits. To another, various kinds of tongues. To another, the interpretation of tongues. All these are empowered by one and the same Spirit who apportions to each one individually as he Wills. And so Paul's argument here is that these various gifts that he has listed, these are gifts that are empowered, abilities that are empowered by the Holy Spirit and distributed among various believers as the Holy Spirit wills. It's up to the Holy Spirit to decide who gets what gift and who doesn't. According to Acts chapter 2 verse 4, it says, and this is happening on the day of Pentecost, this is actually the first place in which we see speaking in tongues occurring in the scriptures. It says, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. So, so, so we see that this is an ability given by the Holy Spirit. This is not something that you, you fake. This is not something that anybody necessarily teaches you to do. This is not, this is not something that, that you, you try to do just to look spiritual. No, this is a Spirit-given ability. And the Spirit gives this ability to whom He wills to give it. Point number two. The Bible defines speaking in tongues as the ability to speak in other languages not previously known to the speaker. And so we're looking at the day of Pentecost, right? So what's happening here is that this is the first time the Holy Spirit comes to indwell and to empower the disciples of Jesus Christ after Jesus would have given them commands and would have commissioned them with the mission and the task that he had for them. Jesus told them, listen, you got to wait in Jerusalem for the Holy Spirit, right? And so the Holy Spirit comes in Acts chapter 2 and, and this is what happens. They, they, they begin to speak in languages that they did not previously know. And you see, there were, there were different types of people from different cities and countries who were in Jerusalem where they were at the time. And they're hearing these disciples speaking in their own native languages. And here's what they say in Acts chapter 2, verses 7 to 8. It says, utterly amazed. They asked, aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in our native language? Therefore, if we're looking for a definition of speaking in tongues, it's necessary for us to conclude that speaking in tongues is speaking in a language not previously known by the speaker. The Holy Spirit is giving that person the ability to do so. I know there's some controversy about whether or not speaking in tongues could also be a heavenly language or the tongues of angels or the unknown tongue. But maybe we'll do that in another video. But I want us to at least agree 
that speaking in tongues is speaking in another language not previously known to the speaker, and this is an ability empowered by the Holy Spirit. Point number three, the Bible teaches that not all believers are expected to speak in tongues. So now we're jumping back to 1 Corinthians 12. We find that Paul's, his entire argument in this passage is that different believers have different spiritual gifts and all of these gifts are necessary for the proper functioning of the body of Christ. Okay, let's, let's read what he says in 1 Corinthians 12, verse 14 to 21. He says, even so, the body is not made up of one part, but of many. Now, if the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason stop being part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason stop being part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But in fact, God has placed the parts in the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. If they were all one part, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts but one body. The eye can say to the hand, I do not need you. And the head can say to the foot, I don't need you. What is Paul's point here in this passage? Paul's point here is that in the same way our physical body has different parts that all contribute to the well and, 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 and to the good functioning of the body, the body of Christ is that way as well. In 1 Corinthians 12 verses 27 to 30, Paul goes on and says, Now you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. And God has placed in the church, first of all, apostles, second, prophets, third, teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healing, of helping, of guidance, and of different kinds of tongues. Now he goes and he asks these set of rhetorical questions. He says, are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Do all work with miracles? Do all have gifts of healing? Do all speak in tongues? Do all interpret? You see, these are, these are a set of rhetorical questions that the Apostle Paul is asking these believers. He's making the point, no, no, not every believer will be an apostle. Not, not every believer will be a prophet. Not every believer will be a teacher. Not every believer will be a miracle worker. Not every believer will speak in tongues. The rhetorical answer here is no, there are different members in the body of Christ with different functions and all of them contribute to the well-functioning of the body. Therefore, Paul assumes here that not every believer will be a tongues speaker. Point number four, the Bible says that the gift of speaking in tongues is something to be desired and should not be forbidden in the church. Uh-oh. In the Bible, the Apostle Paul, he's writing to the Corinthian church in 1 Corinthians 14. And, and in this particular chapter, he is giving them instructions on how they should be using the gifts of tongues and prophecy in the church and how they should be viewing the gifts of tongues and prophecy in the church. His, his point in this passage is that prophecy is of a greater value within the context of the local assembly unless tongues is being interpreted. But Paul also says something very interesting here. Look at 1 Corinthians 14 verses 4 to 5. He says, the one who speaks in a tongue builds up himself, but the one who prophesies builds up the church. Then Paul says, now I want you all to speak in tongues, but even more to prophesy. The one who prophesies is greater than the one who speaks in tongues, unless someone interprets so that the church may be built up. You see, Paul in this passage seems to be expressing his desire for all of the believers to speak in tongues. He's, Paul is here saying, you know what? I, I would really love it if, if all of you guys were tongue speakers. 
And so Paul's overall attitude to speaking in tongues is not one of disdain, it's not one of, of, of discomfort. As a matter of fact, Paul in, in this passage views tongues not as a bad thing, but as a good thing. As a matter of fact, he says in 1 Corinthians 14 and verse 18, I thank God that I speak in tongues more than all of you. He's still writing to the Corinthians here. Paul is rejoicing and thanking God that he's speaking in tongues more than the Corinthian believers. And this leads the Apostle Paul to therefore uh, conclude in, in, in uh, verse 39 saying, So my brothers, earnestly desire to prophesy and do not forbid speaking in tongues. At this point, this is where I would like to express some caution to those pastors out there, those brothers and sisters who are of the cessationist position. I respect your position and I hope you are being as faithful to scripture as you, as you are trying to be. But hey, if your theology is wrong on this particular point, you do realize that telling your church that they shouldn't be speaking in tongues and they should avoid all tongue speaking and they should avoid anybody who speaks in tongues because they're demonic and all of these things, you are actually disobeying these texts of scripture. You're going against what the Apostle Paul was actually saying. Paul said, don't forbid it. And so therefore we conclude that tongues should be allowed. Tongues should be encouraged and tongues should also be shepherded and guided and instructed and wisely guided so that tongues could be used in the right way. And this brings me to my final point here. Point number five, the Bible says that speaking in tongues must accompany interpretation in the gathered assembly of the church. The Apostle Paul says here in 1 Corinthians 14 verses 27 to 28, if any speak in a tongue, let there be only two or at most three, and each in turn, and let someone interpret. But if there is no one to interpret, let each of them keep silent in the church and speak to himself and to God. Paul here was probably dealing with a matter of disorder among the Corinthian brothers and sisters. They were probably elevating the gifts of tongues so highly that, that they needed to be set in order as to how they should be using this gift in the right way. And so Paul says to them that, that this is how you ought to practice the gift of tongues in the assembly. A tongue speaker speaks two at the most or maybe three and there must be interpretation. And so for my, my Pentecostal brothers and sisters who love to blurt out in tongues loudly in the gathered assembly, hear the Apostle Paul's words here. Hear the word of God calling you not to speak tongues just however you feel like in the church. But if there's no one to interpret what is being said, so you can speak between yourself and God. You can pray to God while speaking in tongues. And we also see a little bit of why Paul is giving them this particular guideline because he says in verse 23, if therefore the whole church comes together and all speak in tongues and outsiders or unbelievers enter, will they not say that you are out of your minds? And so these things that we have going on in church where everybody is just speaking in tongues indiscriminately and, and maybe it's a worship session going on and the worship leader says, let's just all speak in tongues and, and some of these things. The, this is an unbiblical practice. If an unbeliever comes in, they'll say, these people are crazy. Therefore, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 14 and verse 13, therefore, one who speaks in a tongue should pray that he may interpret. Hey everyone, thank you for watching this video. If you want me to move on to probably discuss another part of tongues or another aspect of this particular topic, maybe you want you want to want me to discuss the history of speaking in tongues in the church. Can you just um, go ahead and uh, put that in the comment section so I could know what you're thinking, how you're feeling, your thoughts on this video. And hey, tell me what you think about speaking in tongues. Do you think it's something that's a valid practice for today? 
or something that shouldn't be practiced in the church. I'd love to hear from you. Remember, like, share, and subscribe to support this ministry.